All right, here we go. We're gonna talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, I'm gonna go through uh, what like the content you need to know in terms of this pretty quickly at the beginning of this. The rest of this video is gonna be a lot about things that I just think are interesting. And there's gonna be a whole other mess of videos that I'm just gonna post up about practical applications that I think are super interesting and you can either watch those or not. That is totally your choice. Um, but I'm still gonna talk about them because they make me happy. So here we go. We said we're going to order the electromagnetic spectrum by frequency, which means we're gonna order them from least dangerous to most dangerous. I find sometimes it's, it's best, uh, if I was doing this in class, I'd ask questions and we kind of work our way inwards. So here we go, the electromagnetic spectrum or EM spectrum, because I'm gonna get tired of writing electromagnetic spectrum over and over and over again. And so we're gonna go from low frequency to high frequency. And let's just acknowledge, by the way, then that this is because of the wave equation from long wavelength to short wavelength, even though we are ordering them by frequency. And if we're ordering them by frequency, low frequency means long period. And this is short period, all right? And we said that these are also from the least dangerous to the most dangerous. Okay, so here we go. If I had to ask you, what is the most dangerous type of wave? Hopefully, when you were putting that together, you thought to yourself, oh, well, that's pretty clear. That is gamma radiation or gamma rays, right? These are, uh, we'll talk about them, but you know, you think about the Incredible Hulk, if you've ever read comic books or seen the movies, gamma radiation, really dangerous. Uh, Spider-Man, you know, the mythology of Peter Parker uh, gets mutated because of gamma rays. Um, that's why the area around Chernobyl is really dangerous because it's giving off gamma rays. So hopefully you've heard about gamma rays before and the fact that they're dangerous. So what's another uh, next most dangerous wave? Hopefully what you thought was X-rays. There's a reason why you have to wear a big leather, or excuse me, not leather, a big um, lead apron when you're getting x-rays uh, at the dentist or at the doctor's office over the part they're not taking the x-rays over. They wouldn't try and shield you if it weren't dangerous. All right, what's the next most dangerous? Well, if you're a pasty white like me, uh, you know that the next most dangerous here are UV rays. All right, uh, and we'll see that there's different types of UV rays uh, there's going to be UVA, UVB, UVC. Okay, so those are the most dangerous. And, in, and then the least dangerous. Well, hopefully you guess that the least dangerous are going to be radio waves. They're around us all the time, right? And they couldn't possibly be dangerous despite what some crazy, 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 crazy people are saying about, you know, a bunch of other things. People are like, oh, there's too many radio waves around and uh, they're, it's destroying us. Uh, go on, put your tinfoil hat on, and have fun in your bunker in Idaho, right? Like, radio waves are not dangerous. Uh, well, what's next here? Well, uh, usually people, people uh, don't really kind of know what's going on down here, so I'm going to help us out. UV, remember, stands for ultraviolet, right? Ultraviolet, meaning above violet. So what's probably next? Above violet... Oh, it's probably violet, meaning right here is our visible light. And if we're talking from high frequency to low frequency, well, apparently violet's gotta be adjacent to the, vi to the ultraviolet, and we all know the order of the rainbow, right? You are a friend and mine, Roy G. Biv, meaning red, orange, yellow, um, blue, it's a green, or a G -biv, uh, blue, indigo, and violet. And so uh, red being the lowest frequency, violet being the highest frequency. So if that's red, what's uh, next to red? Oh, well, that's infrared, which literally means below red, okay? And so from there, we can guess there's only one type of wave that's left. That type of wave is a microwave. And that is the electromagnetic spectrum in order from longest wavelength, lowest frequency, to highest wavelength, lowest, or the highest frequency, lowest wavelength. Okay? 
uh, and you want to memorize that order um, because that's just a smart thing to know. All right, cool. Uh, we're going to kind of go a little bit more into depth with the electromagnetic spectrum, but I'm going to show you this here. Uh, if we want to know, well, what are those sizes? They've, uh, they've done it slightly differently. They've went from one frequency up to 10 to the 25th frequency. So it's just going up where my list went down. And you can see that radio waves are from here to here. And they say television waves is part of the radio wave band. And you can see that's from about, let's see, that's 10 to the first, 10 to the second. So about 100 meters long, all the way up to, that's a million there, uh, 100 million um, meter of other uh, hertz is that frequency, right? Then you have microwaves, which are from here to the here, infrared, which is this band. Now you'll notice also that these bands overlap. There's no hard and fast definition as to where these things are, uh, but there you go. You'll notice here that we have uh, the visible spectrum, which is just a really, 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 really tiny slice of the overall electromagnetic spectrum. Human beings have evolved to see just a very, 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 very narrow slice from about 10 to the 4th, 14th through about 10 to the 15th uh, hertz, which is down here. If you look uh, in terms of what is the size of those waves, it is in, they have these in centimeters. This is on the order of from 400 nanometers to about seven, or actually 700 nanometers to about 400 nanometers. I'm gonna show you another chart with those wavelengths on them in a couple minutes, right? And then going up, you can see X-rays getting up to 10 to the 20th Hertz and gammas, everything above that. So really, really large numbers. And then when talking about the wavelengths, really small, okay? Here's a page that you're gonna get. Uh, it's attached to this post. And it's going to have, um, on the second page of a handout, it's going to have the wavelengths of light in the vacuum. And these are those ranges. And they're ranges because we know there's different types of red. And all the types of reds that we call reds are just somewhere within there. The types of oranges are in there. Once again, not hard and fast, uh, but just sort of, um, if I wanted to identify the colors, I could by their wavelength. Why do we talk wavelengths of light in a vacuum? Well, generally, we experience uh, uh, light in vacuum or air, which is functionally almost the same thing as vacuum. We'll talk about some other things in this packet a little bit later. So you will see both of this and this uh, attached to the post. But I wanted to talk about some uh, applications of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, like how do some things work? So radio, let's go there. Actually, before I get into, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll do it this way, radio. Uh, Radio is not just one band. There's a bunch of different bands of radio. So if you were on in your car and you're playing with your radio, you would know there's two major bands, right? What are they? Hopefully you said the AM band and the FM band. And that is, those are the two general bands. So when you turn on the AM band, uh, think about a station AM. What would that be? And you're probably thinking something like 880 or 1010. Uh, sports fans think of other things, and I don't know what they are because sports ball, whatever. But like 880. Well, 880 what? And it's 880 kilohertz, right? That is the frequency at which those radio waves are sent out from their source. 1010, what's that? 1010 kilohertz. Remember, kilo just means times 10 to the third. So what is those about when you're talking about a radio? Well, if you are in your car and you're playing with the AM band, you'll note that the AM band goes up and down by tens, right? 880, 890, 900, right? You can't get the in-between frequencies. Well, what's going on there? Well, when your radio is tuned to 880, you hear the signal sent out by this particular radio station. When you're tuned to 1010, it's, you only hear things that are sent out by this. So it seems like when you make something in your radio at that frequency, it only gets waves transmitted to it at that frequency. So hopefully the word that you're thinking about, because it's gonna be the key word for this entire video, is resonance. 
right? And the concept of vibration by sympathy. When you have two things whose natural modes of vibration match, you get an efficient energy transfer between those two things. What you're actually doing in your radio is you're changing something in your radio such that it vibrates at 880 kilohertz, right? And therefore, it can pick up the signal coming from the radio station, which is also vibrating something at 880 kilohertz. And that's why you only hear that signal from that radio station when you've matched your radio to that. And that should make you think also, like when you're at something where you're near it, but not at it, sometimes you can hear that radio station a little bit. Well, why is that? Well, remember the concept resonance doesn't say that you don't hear other frequencies, but just that you have a maximally efficient transfer of energy when you're at those frequencies. So when you're near them, you can kind of get a little bit of the signal, but it's not transmitting very efficiently. Okay, so. Uh, that's the, the concept of what your radio is doing. FM, just slightly different. Let's take an FM station, maybe 92.7 or maybe 100.3. Well, what are those? That's 92.7 gigahertz and 100.3 gigahertz, right? Uh, actually, not gigahertz, uh, megahertz. Wrong one. So those radio stations just transmit at a higher frequency. And so, uh, once again, they just go up by the 0.2s or by the 0.2 megahertz. And so every radio station by the FCC is given a very specific uh, frequency at which to broadcast. No one's allowed to broadcast within a small range so that you can have a more efficient transfer even when you're close because, you know, radios are not perfect. So you're probably not exactly at 92.7. You're probably at 92.6. 942 or whatnot, but you're not close to other radio stations, so you don't have to worry about picking them up. Uh, if you've ever been driving somewhere and you get like the two radio stations cutting into each other, well, that's just because the FCC, when they give radio licenses, only give them for a certain amount of distance. So you're allowed to have an antenna with a power that goes out a certain distance, and we know what happens to waves as they go further from their source. Well, the intensity gets less. So at some point, the intensity is so small that you wouldn't pick it up. Um, and sometimes those spheres of, 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 uh, of those radio stations overlap a bit. And so you sort of lose one and gain the other. But the FCC has given individual radio stations license to be the primary source of those waves at that, that place. So there's radio. Uh, back in the olden days, like when I was growing up in the 80s, um, television was not coming through the cable or through the satellite. It came through radio waves. And there were two uh, radio bands. It was the VHF um, and UHF bands. Can you guess on what those stand for? And if you know, they're actually called the very high frequency and the ultra high frequency bands. The very high frequency uh, VHF was from channels two to channels 13 and UHF was channels 14 through 68. Um, and generally all your major broadcast was in the VHF band, your channel two, channel four, channel five, channel seven. Once again, if you notice there's space between those for the reason that you know, resonance doesn't mean that you don't pick up anything. Uh, and that's how television used to be broadcast. So there you go, radio, it's about tuning things. It's about uh, resonance. So microwave, so what do you think about microwave ovens, right? And you might've thought like, oh, microwaves, it's so low frequency, but they're dangerous. Uh, Cause you know, we wouldn't put certain things into microwave. It would be too dangerous to do it. Well, not really. Um, microwaves in general are not that dangerous. In fact, your cell phone right now is giving out microwaves. Your cell phone, every cell phone has its own microwave signature, right? A specific frequency at which it picks up and puts out signals, right? So there are microwaves going through you right now through your pocket, right? If that's where it is or from the table, there are microwaves everywhere, but you're like, oh no, how come I'm not boiling inside? Like if I had stuck my head in a microwave oven, well, that's because a microwave oven is a very, very, very specific frequency. Microwave ovens, if you look on the back of it, you might see two, four, five, zero megahertz because that is the frequency at which there is something in the microwave oven it most likely vibrates at. Well, why that frequency and no other frequencies? Well, how does a microwave oven work? Well, there's a video that I've attached to this post that will explain it, but here's the short of it. 
If you've ever tried to put a dry piece of toast in the microwave and turn it on, you get it out, it doesn't heat up the toast. Why? Because this frequency is the resonant frequency of the bonds in the water molecule. The specific lengths in that water molecule resonate very specifically at this frequency and no others. So what you're doing is a microwave oven transmits energy through resonance efficiently specifically to water molecules, causing them to vibrate back and forth and that friction that happens between uh, the different molecules and water molecules vibrating back and forth is what heats up your food from the inside. So. That's why uh, you got to put a little bit of moisture in things in order for microwaves to work. Um, that's why you can put things like what's a microwave safe uh, device. A microwave safe device is something that doesn't have a lot of water in it, like plastics really don't have a lot of water in the molecules. Um, and so they're microwave safe. Um, we don't put metals in them because uh, metal objects reflect those microwaves and therefore you just have a buildup of energy because nothing is absorbing that energy and that leads to bad things. Don't put metal in your microwave. So infrared. Uh, the application I want to talk about infrared is infrared goggles. If you've ever said infrared goggles or seen um, uh, any of like the Terminator movies or like Predator, right? They're the heat vision goggles if you ever see them. Well, it turns out that every object above zero degrees Kelvin puts out uh, electromagnetic radiation because its molecules are vibrating, right? Because that's what it means to have temperature. It means that your molecules are moving around. Specifically in solids, it means your molecules are vibrating. Um, and it just so happens that at the temperatures that we experience in human existence from about, oh, I don't know, negative 20 degrees Celsius to about, you know, uh, 40 degrees Celsius, that's what most things in our experience, human or physical beings uh, experience, that those temperatures vibrate in such a way that they put out uh, vi um, stuff in the infrared range. And so what infrared goggles are doing is they have a detector in them that resonates in the infrared range. And then it just uh, takes those signals and takes different parts of that and assigns them to different colors. So we see it in colors, but it's not actually those colors. That's just the way that that um, device is doing. I have a, a video for you about infrared goggles if you're interested. Visible light. So why do human beings see visible light but not others? So what is the mechanism in our eye that causes us to see color? Well, if you've heard about them, there is two parts of uh, the eye specifically that helps us see color. And both those parts are on the retina of the eye. And there are two organelles that are called rods and cones, okay? Rods and cones help us see light. So rods allow us to see bright versus dark, okay? Grayscale. They are an organelle that, that pick up on how strong or how intense the light is and send signals to the brain based on how intense the light is. But cones uh, are able to see different frequencies of light because the cone is shaped, it's actually a lopped off cone. It's shaped like this, such that different parts of the cone resonate at different frequencies. The short end of the cone resonates with the shorter wavelengths of light, so the violets, and the long end of the cone violates, uh, resonates, so that length matches uh, a length, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about standing waves, NV over 2L, um, that L matches about the frequency of red lights. So since different parts of the cones vibrate or resonate with different things, we can detect different signals. Uh, just so that you know, our cones are an evolutionary advantage. Why? Well, in nature, um, what colors are dangerous things in nature? Those are reds and violets, those really bright colors. Usually nature is trying to tell us that those things are poisonous. Uh, so it's sort of an evolutionary advantage to see color in that perspective if we were going to be vegetarians and uh, uh, you know plant eaters. Uh, so that's super important. And if we live in an environment where, you know, red looking um, uh, things are poisonous animals or snakes, whatnot, you know to stay away from them. An interesting thing about uh, that, that we've discovered anthropologically over the last couple of years is the human beings have only started seeing the color blue in the last about 2000 years. Prior to that, 
um, the, the, there wasn't really a part of this that had uh, neurons attached to it that allowed us to see the color blue. How do we know about that? Well, uh, the evidence is a little bit indirect, but you start seeing in literature a whole bunch of no references to the color blue in any ancient literature, right? Like, for example, the Red Sea. <laughs> uh, the Red Sea doesn't look red. It, it looks blue, actually. Um, but if you can't see the color blue uh, and there's some red aspect of it there because light is usually uh, full spectrum and you see a little bit of redness in it, they thought, they thought it was red. And there's all these hints in literature and in music and in art that prior to that, that we didn't see the color blue because there was no need to do it. We start seeing references to the blue sky only round about zero, right, right uh, at zero AD. That's about the first, I actually don't remember the first time uh, off the top of my head, but it's a fairly recent invention, which I think is just kind of neat. So the visible, they resonate with different parts of the cones of the eye. So people who are colorblind, either they have a neurological problem where the signal from the cone doesn't work or the cone itself is deformed, right? So if that cone is shaped like you know, this rather than what it's supposed to uh, or in other ways, shape or form dis deformed that you're just not getting signals that resonate with specific frequencies. You don't see those colors. So it could be a physical deformity or it could be a neurological piece with the signals that are being sent from that. Next, UV. UV is sometimes called black light. Why is it called black light? Well, because it's outside of the visible spectrum. Our eyes can't see it. But what we tend to see uh, when something shines with black light is it looks like it glows purple um, or it looks like it glows green. Well, why is that? Well, there are certain molecules that resonate with UV light, specifically phosphorus and phosphates. They absorb the, the UV light and then spit out a lower frequency of light in the uh, visible range, which is why we see those objects glowing with those frequencies. And you can talk, uh, you can see the video I have attached about UV light. Now, I did want to talk about, well, why is UV light dangerous? Well, we know that we put on sunblock in order to protect us from UV light coming from the sun because the sun is putting out UV radiation. Now, normally, most UV radiation doesn't even get down to Earth, but some of it does, specifically the lower frequency or A, a UVA. UVB, UVC, dual generally don't get to Earth. Well, why? Well, what is it that protects us from UVB and UVC? Hopefully you know it's the ozone layer. The ozone molecule, take a guess, hopefully you said resonates with UVB and UVC. And so what happens is those molecules take on that energy and break down. The ozone breaks down from the O3 molecule into O2 molecules. And uh, so the ozone depletes over time. So there's gotta be physical processes that, re that regenerate that. And so back in the 70s, when there were all these things being released into the atmosphere that were chemically breaking down ozone, that was really bad because UVB and UVC was getting to the earth, causing skin cancer. Well, why do you, does UV radiation do skin cancer? Well, UVA, well, well, let's think about what's happening. When you get a lot of UVA, you get a sunburn. Well, what's sunburn? Well, it just so happens that the skin cell resonates with UV radiation. And so what happens then is the skin cell is made up largely of water. And what happens is that water boils inside of that skin cell that's absorbed all that radiation and explodes. That's why your skin gets red and puffy when you have sunburn because it's literally just exploded skin cells. Right? That's why it hurts so much. You've literally exploded skin cells in your body. And that's why it takes time to recover from sunburn because your body has to make new sun uh, uh, skin cells as well as flush out all the excess water that is now in between the cells of your body. Uh, so no bueno there. Why else are UVB and UVC uh, dangerous? Well, they resonate with a very specific part of the skin cell specifically with the nucleus of the skin cell. And a nucleus, when it gets a lot of energy, do you know what it does? It replicates, right? So UVB and UVC short triggers the mechanism in the human body that tells a cell to normally replicate and tells it to replicate a lot. And hopefully you know what an uncontrolled replication is, and that is cancer. That is why UVB and UVC cause cancer, because of resonance. 
Now, what do we do to protect us from UV radiation? We put on sunblock. So what must sunblock do? And hopefully you said there's a molecule in it that resonates with uh, the UVA, UVB, and UVC uh, light. And that's exactly what it does. So it's a layer of lotion on top of you that has uh, molecules in it that resonate with that and absorb that energy before it gets to your skin, right? So what's SPF? SPF is just molality, right? And remember that from chemistry, it's parts per million of the number of molecules dissolve of that, of that absorbing uh, molecule that's in the lotion. So higher SPF just means that there's more molecules. Here's the problem. With anything over SPF 30, it's a total ripoff because over time, uh, when that lotion dries out, those molecules, then the, the stuff flakes off your skin and becomes ineffective. With 70 SPF, the lotion is gonna flake off your skin well before you get enough sun to break down that amount of molecules. More is not always better. It is better to reapply sunblock because the lotion will break down uh, before enough of the chemical breaks down. Um, X-rays. X-rays, once again, they're dangerous to the human body. We know that X-rays can penetrate through the human body, but they can't penetrate through bone, so that's how they create that negative image. But what's problematic about X-rays? Well, that, uh, radi that wavelength of light uh, resonates with most of our internal organs, which is bad because our internal organs absorb that energy, and the same problem that we had with the skin cells with UV, they uh, sometimes get the signal to replicate. That's why we can't really take on that much X-ray radiation without it being dangerous. And lastly, gamma radiation, hugely dangerous. Gamma radiation literally resonates with almost every cell in our body, every organelle in our body. Our bodies absorb it so quickly and it can lead to cancers and burns. A radiation burn is just literally the cells exploding and that's happening also with your internal organs. Uh, human beings can't withstand a lot of gamma radiation without that happening. Luckily, um, um, we know how to block these things. Lead shields can block x-rays. Gamma radiation literally can be blocked by a piece of paper. If you've ever seen people in those big hazmat suits that are going into the radiation zones, it's literally just waxed paper because um, that can't get through. It just turns out the higher the frequency, the lower the penetrating power through most objects. Um, so microwave, microwaves and radio waves are constantly going through us. Same thing with infrared. Visible, we talked about, goes through lots of things, uh, transparent and trans, uh, translucent things. Um, and then these things start getting blocked more and more by stuff. So there's a quick tour through the electromagnetic spectrum. If you have any, I, I mean, like literally I do it, usually in class we do a two-day lesson on this because the questions are great. If you have any questions, please come to office hours and we can talk through so many different applications of this. But remember, at the end of the day, electromagnetic spectrum, all of the applications are all about what? Resonance.